Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today, Daniel. Yeah, thanks for being interested in these topics. It's some of my favorite stuff in the world. So it's fun to talk, talk about and great to meet you. Absolutely. Yeah, so nice to meet you. And yeah, I would love to just dive into some of your work. Um, I was listening to some of the other podcasts you were on and there was a lot of uh, how I tend to do it on this podcast is we kind of just like go right into the nitty gritty of it and just like go into your work, what you're working on, your ideas, your perspectives. Um, and so the the I'm most familiar with your book, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. Um, there's so many different maps, uh, frames, perspectives that you lay out in there. And yeah, it just feels like there's just a lot to talk about. And I'm excited to see what comes up as we start diving into some of these topics. Great. Yeah, I'm excited by this too. Good. Amazing. Um, so yeah, to get it started, um, one of the things that I've been finding most fascinating about your work is this um, distinction between concentration and uh, insight. Uh, you make this very clear distinction between there's these like kind of two separate types of practices and um, insight being a little bit more uh, becoming conscious of the nature of self, of reality, really noticing how the self operates. You talk a lot about how... Uh, it's becoming aware of the three characteristics, um, whereas concentration is a little bit less focused on the three characteristics, which I'm, I'm going to get them wrong, but impermanent dissatisfaction and no self, right? That's it. Um, yeah. And so then you talk about concentration as being maybe not, maybe a little less focused on becoming conscious of the nature of those and more on just like uh, building a really strong focus um, and really being able to kind of like merge with a focus object. Um, and yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to talk about because, you know, given my experience with meditation, I've tended to only go with insight practices, mostly self-inquiry and noting are the two practices that I've, that I've stuck with for the past quite a few years. And it's been pretty destabilizing, honestly, like it's been, it's That's at times I feel ill-equipped to handle some of the destabilizing nature of these experiences, mm. Um, which you touch on in the book a lot, how insight tends to be a little bit more destabilizing, whereas concentration- or a lot kind of, more. A lot more, a lot more. Sometimes um, varies by the person. There's a wide range of how people react to it. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, I would love to hear you speak on the distinction between these, help people understand the difference between these types of practices and um, maybe how you're relating to them. I know you talk a little bit in the book about uh, potentially starting with concentration to build a foundation and then moving to insight, or I'm curious how you're kind of relating to, you know, someone's, if someone's really trying to deepen their, their meditating daily, maybe hitting a wall, really trying to deepen their practice. How would you relate to kind of like concentration versus insight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot in what you, well, you said. So, so going back to basics, right? So old school Buddhism, and in fact, most strains of Buddhism, there's like the three major trainings. One is, you know, um, skillful use of body, speech, and mind, usually translated as morality or ethical action, ethical mm -hmm. thought, ethical speech, right speech is, is sort of a loaded term, but you know what I mean? Skillful speech, skillful action, skillful thought. And then there's concentration, which is learning to um, basically ha have a high degree of control of what attention is doing, what it's including, what it's excluding. So to exclude unskillful things and things you don't want to focus on then, and to include and cultivate positive qualities of mind, right? And then insight training or training in wisdom is to see the three characteristics of all sensations arise and vanish, and it's designed to produce insight stages. But that process of deconstructing the illusion of a self in all of this can be confusing, disorienting, destabilizing, and go through some relatively predictable highs, lows, weirds, plateaus, openings, contractions, buzzy energetic stuff, and some weird things as outlined in those books right there. So that's the Vasudhi Maga and the Abhidhamma and uh, the Vimudhi Maga. So these are old meditation manuals that talk about the stages of insight and the things that you might expect people to go through if they start to make uh, progress. And so if those are all three trainings, the Buddha recommended all three. But then there's the debate about in which order and what do you start with? And the traditional text would say you go in order. You start with a foundation in ethical action, speech, body, mind, skillful, et cetera. And then you build... You start to, to work on the instrument, like the microscope or the telescope, the camera lens, 
that can look at experience and and say this is what's going on and and get some skill with that and then deconstruct your reality it's the traditional presentation right and then you deconstruct the sense of self as being any of the elements or any of the four foundations of mindfulness or any of the six sense doors or the you know anything and so you systematically deconstruct um every little flickering bit of experience and you see it all in the light of wisdom right so that's the theory and then practically though people may start in different places so you, there's the insights you know well i'll start with the concentration first school because it seems to be the older one in some ways right and so the concentration first school says we really need a, a mind that can clearly see what's going on and has some positive qualities such that the process of insight is less destabilizing and less complicated and you can just from a calm place notice that all these things come and go and aren't you and with that level of equanimity and tranquility and bliss or whatever positive factors you have then the process of insight becomes easier it's easier to digest the notions of suffering and impermanence and that you might not exist as a separate stable coherent discrete entity that stands outside of causality and is a watcher a doer a, me a beer a knower a controller an agent um, something that continues across time and all that and then you have the insight first schools that have, I think, arguably are somewhat later, although even in the old text, you see those who really seem to do insight practice as the primary thing, sorry, Puta being the classic example, versus those who focused heavily on um, the jhanas like Moggallana, for example, the old, you know, original um, pupils of the Buddha. But although even the way Sariputta's practice is described, even in like, you know, um, one by one as they occurred, it's that he like, he got into jhana and then he deconstructed the jhana and he got into the next jhana and he deconstructed the jhana. And the jhana are these progressively refined stages of concentration, right? Initially blissful and peaceful and effortful and then blissful and peaceful without the effort and then more tranquil and expansive and equanimous and eventually formless um, states. And so... Um, then, but the the insight first schools say basically no. You say you can just go straight for the thing if if you've got the the karma or the skill or the talent or the stability, um, which is something of a big ask. It turns out, and the circumstances and the supports and all of the the things you would want to do this to be in place first. And then if you have all those things, you can just directly deconstruct the sense that any of this is you at a high rate of speed and precision. The whole thing flips over, and you get stages of awakening, and then you're good to go, and that'll help your other practices, right? And so, but this is an ancient debate, and I think it really varies by the person and the setting and the circumstances and the risk tolerance and the goals and the proclivities and what your situation is and where you are on the thing, which approach may work for you. And that's actually typically a pretty long conversation. So it's very typical for me to talk with like people like 90 minutes or something, sort of exploring which of those kind of makes sense for the person where they are at that time in that place with their level of resources and talents and challenges and, and what their interests are, what their goals are, what feels right to them at that time, right? Which is a major thing. And so that, that's kind of, hopefully that's a lot to react to. I'm going to stop there. Yeah, as you, as you were talking, I was coming up with like, yeah, how do you, and I think you kind of answered the question, like having like an, a deep conversation with someone that has experience with meditation. I'm like, in my experience, I was like, I'm not really sure how to sense into those proclivities, those risk factors. Like a lot of them don't feel super apparent to me until I just like go over the cliff and then it's super destabilizing, you know? And it, Well, you mentioned the cliffs like, and the destabilizing stuff. Do you want to talk about that? Because it's probably going to be the most interesting topic to most people listening of anything we've talked about, right? That's Let's you know, do it. Yeah. What, what you got? Yeah. What so um, going really deep into to self-inquiry, um, also um, supported with um, some psychedelic use as well. Um, kind of like intensified it as well, but it's very common these days. Actually, the vast majority of people I talk to now, psychedelics are some part of the mix. It's right, very much they part of the to, they seem current to... consciousness exploring, enhancing, deconstructing trend. Totally, it's definitely definitely picking up uh, out here. I'm living in Boulder, Colorado, and it's it's oh, quite, yeah. quite a quite a thing out here. Um, 
Yeah. So, so with the help of psychedelics, but also, also sustaining, I was sustaining a self-inquiry practice for daily for a while and was really just going into like, who am I? Who am I? What is the nature of experience? I'm reading a lot of books on Zen. And as I, as I would go into that, um, there was a lot of uh, sort of existential dread, existential fear that would come up as I would go deeper into that practice. It was just like a, um, this like fear of like nothingness or this fear, or, or I don't even know, I, I feel like I don't have a sense of that word enough to be using it, but, but this fear of like non-existence was probably the biggest one. Mm. Um, and just like um, confronting, yeah, a, as I, as I would go deeper and feel like I'd be making some ground, then as soon as I would like be, feel like I'd be really moving towards like contacting my experience in a more pure way, um, it would just get, it, it would just get, um, when I say destabilizing, it was, it, it was just like really like existential kind of terror almost was the, was, was the feeling that I would get, it would just like surface so much fear and terror and in, mm. a, in a way that, that was pretty destabilizing, it made it hard to like, just go about regular things in life at, at some point where I had to like stop because the, the, the existential fear was just really, really intense. And, um, yeah, at some point I had to stop doing it because I was like, I, I, this is a little bit too much to handle. I need to, after, after a while, the, the, literally the intuition that I had was like, I need to have a solid, I need to have, and maybe it was just like this egoic drive to like feel a sense of uh, security or realness in something, but, but it was very much like nothing. It I was very much in the space of, I don't really know what's real. I don't really know what reality is. I don't really know who I am. Everything is utterly groundless and I have nothing to stand on and it's utterly terrifying. And like, I don't know how to make it not terrifying. That, that was kind of the nature of the destabilizing experience. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing. Um, you must have had some energetic openings and some peak experiences or whatever you want to call them. I would call them rising and passing away generally in that mix somewhere, perhaps. Yeah, with psychedelics, definitely kind of initiated that. Um, Tell me about that. Um, yeah, it was it was one. It was like a high. There was two experiences that really catalyzed something. It was a one was a very high dose mushroom experience. Um, What's high um, dose? Um, six, Five gram. Six. Yeah, six grams. Yeah. Now so it was, it was very high dose to the point where I like. I was at, I, towards the end of the experience, it was like, I don't feel like I'm ever going to have a self again. And then that was pretty terrifying. Cause it like, it felt like it was permanent. Um, just like that shift. And I don't, and I guess I yeah, definitely was not, um, prepared enough to handle that space. Um, and then the second one was, um, I, I experienced, uh, five MEO. Um, oh, that's yeah. That's another really common one where people describe and, it, and, it, and during the experience, it's like you can't really describe what the experience is, but coming back from the experience and trying to integrate it was was like, yeah, the destabilizing stuff was was the three months after that experience, three, three to probably six of like, mm. um, yeah, trying to reconcile what happened during that experience, how to, yeah, go about life after having had some really peak experience, it felt like in and to the point where after that i was like okay no more psychedelics <laughs> i was basically like uh need to stop de uh deconstructing for a little bit um it's getting it's getting a little too deep um but yeah and, and i've taken a couple of years off and just done meditation ever since then and it, and it has helped a lot and i've just been noticing yeah just having a daily meditation practice without psychedelics has been really stabilizing um, but also I noticed as I start getting into the more, um, self-inquiry noting practices, that's when it kind of surfaces a lot of it. Yeah, that makes sense. So, and it sounds like you've, you've looked at the book and so you may have some, some sense of the ancient maps. Is that right? Yes. Have you looked at those and seen any resonance or seen anything that really seems to make you go, oh yeah, that that's familiar. Um, a little bit, a little bit. I, I. I don't know. There's still some part of me that has resistance or, or there's some part of me that I don't know. I don't know. There's this, there's this sense in me that 
always doubts when I look at a map and I see a stage, it'll always doubt whether I experienced something at that stage. Cause like reading all of these books, um, Zen and stuff, it, it basically, the sense I get is that there's like a lot of work to be done on this path. And if I see there's like 10 stages and I resonate with stage six, I consistently doubt it. I'm like, there's no way I, I'm experiencing a stage six thing. Like this is going to take decades and decades and decades of practice, or at least that's the assumption in my head. And so a lot of time, a lot of times, yeah, currently how I'm relating to them is there's just like a lot of like trying to see myself in the first one or two or three stages and then kind of doubting whether, but, but at the same time, what I'm hearing is maybe, maybe some of those peak experiences were, were, were peaking some of the, some of the stages a little bit. Further. Yeah. It's very common for me to talk with people who on a psychedelic cross, you know, sort of a point of no return or what I would call the arising and passing away. And then they end up in what I would call the knowledges of suffering or dark night borrowing from St. John of the Cross, you know, presuming some sort of perennialist uh, lens that you would look at. These are all, it's all kind of similar territory. And so it's not uncommon at all for people to find themselves with the sense of self dissolving or threatened or whatever, to be like, ah, no, I really do want to be a stable thing. Not recognizing that is in the flow of ordinary sensations. It is in that letting go into this ordinary stream of just this moment right here, changing, 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 that is the freedom. So the freedom comes when you realize that none of these sensations could actually grasp or fix or freeze this reality, right? These colors can't fix or freeze reality. These physical sensations can't fix or freeze reality. But the attempt to do that, the notion that, ooh, I've got to be able to fix or freeze reality. There has to be some of these sensations I can grasp onto when literally they're all just changing constantly, as you've noticed, if you pay attention to anything, but they keep recurring, right? A sense of I am here shows up. I am here. I am here. It changes. I am here. You know, it, it, it moves through. And so it's it's in that tension between um, the wanting to attempt to solidify and nothing being solidifiable that the suffering comes in, or one of the ways the suffering comes in. Suffering is very complicated, actually, a lot of aspects to it, but that's one of the, the key ones. And so the notion that I am or I am not, these are just things that arise like the weather. So, and they just change, change, change on their own. And, but getting used to that, right? Figuring out how to be comfortable enough in this natural flow of just this moment unfolding and changing and changing in both analog and digital ways. So it's 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 impermanent in both senses of the term, it's frames and it's waves. Mm -hmm. So getting comfortable with that and learning to stay more um, experientially open and flowy in the face of that and to recognize even when you go, ah, even this, uh, Right, even this is has flow in it. This has changed. This is arising. It changes all the little sensations of aha. Those themselves have intricacy and change, and and they're shifting and they're flickering and they're shimmering and they're doing what mm -hmm. they do. So they have the same nature of ungraspability, unfixability, unfreezeability, right? And even the notion of the sense of contraction and wanting to hold is itself a changing, flowing phenomenon. And so the question is, can you start to also be comfortable with that and recognize that's also always the way things have been. And somehow you were okay before when things were that way. It's not like yeah. there was ever a time when things could fix or freeze. Mm -hmm. It's not true. And so it's always been this way. And somehow you're all right before you started to get into an existential post-psychedelic crisis or whatever. <laughs> you know. And so there's nothing to fear, but fear itself. And even that is just one more changing, intricate, interesting pattern of sensations. That's also a relatively small portion of your experience. So the other thing I offer is if you notice, like if you think a really frightening thought, I don't exist. Ah, only a very small portion of your actual experience is having a bad day. So mm -hmm. if you look at your experiences, like the whole room and the screen and the chair and the walls around you in the space, what portion of your actual experience is having a hard time when you feel fear about existential issues? And how bad is that pain actually? Like how bad is the is the pain of that fear? Is it actually that bad that you should freak out about it? Is it like as bad as stubbing a toe or being kicked in the shin or no? 
Yeah. Right. Right. It's a it's a mild mild little sensations in one small part of the room. And so, in a, in a sense, <laughs> afraid of not existing. Ah, you know? <laughs> and so, like, when you start to notice it through that insight lens, which is just what are the actual sensations? What's actually happening here? Mm -hmm. Not with your eyes closed, eyes open. This is helpful for this. Like, here's a whole lot of sights, a whole lot of sounds, the whole room of experience. And of this whole room of experience, a little bit of it feels a little bit of uncomfortable sensations. Where Where do you feel the fear, by the way? Where do you feel it? I feel it probably like upper chest or like somewhere somewhere in the chest area. And how bad is the pain of, of the fear? Right now, it's not really bad at all. But even if you tried to make it really bad, how bad could it get? I try to make it really bad. Like on a scale of one to 10 of pain, like of actual like physical six, pain. Six or something. Or it could five. get to a six out of 10 pain. That painful, are you sure? You sure it could get to a six out of 10 pain? Really? You can make yourself hurt that bad? No, oh, right. You said you said you said how much does it hurt, and then I, that's what I responded, and then you said physical, and it's like the actual physical sensation. So that's what I'm talking about. Not that bad. You, yeah. you can yeah. right. You can get yourself yeah. six out of ten pain just by thinking. Right, right, right. No, no, no. It's not physical. Impressive. Like wow. Not it's not like physical. Method acting level. <laughs> no, yeah, prob probably like a three or something. Um, and how big an area? Maybe like eight inches. Eight inches by it's what? It's like probably like a, like a like a six six by five or something. Okay, how much is that? What what portion of your experience is that? What percent of your experience is that? Five. Five percent, you think? Ten. Um, let me... Ten percent. Okay, so how big is the room? You're in? Hard to put a say the room on. you're in is like ten by ten by ten. Mm-hmm. So that's like a thousand cubic feet. Am I right? Something like that. Yeah. And this area would be like what, like a quarter of a cubic foot or something. Oh, you're saying, you're saying not just my bodily experience. No, of your experience, that. all of your experience. All of it, all of it. Yeah. It that's what you're waking than, up is the field of experience. Than, yeah. Right. So like it, it's maybe a quarter of a thousandth. Yeah. Right. So it's like 0.025% or something. 0.025% yeah. of your total experience has three out of 10 pain. Very little. Yeah. And that, how much of a problem is that actually? Not much. And how much of the rest of the field is having any problem? None. There you go. So, and this is like, it, this is the kind of thing that would throw someone so off their game. So what, what would you, what would you describe? Like, what is the difference between someone that feels that fear and gets thrown off their game by it? And another person that just witnesses it as one, one thousandth of their experience. Is it like deeply attaching to it, seeing it, the fear as who they just, are? Just or a very simple, basic reality testing. Like we just did. It's just not an just, abstract or esoteric thing. Very just, easy. Uh, noticing that this it's is a small a portion of your experience. It's a small, small. And those are some sensations and they're not that bad. And most of the other sensations are fine. And so like 0.025% of your experience has three out of 10 pain sometimes. And this is a reason to be totally thrown off your game. Really? You sure? Think about that. Like in this space, most of the space is okay. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. insight so you're noticing sensations as they are right now all of them mm -hmm. and then you notice almost all of this is totally fine and a little bit of it is not quite fine and then can you see that as an interesting pattern as part of the wider pattern of this 3d field of what the room and the body and the mind and the heart and gotten all that Mm-hmm.
And can you notice that actually most of the time that isn't even there, right? It doesn't even hurt three out of 10 from fear. That's right. actually only sometimes when the thoughts arise. And the thoughts themselves are these very wispy little things in comparison to the screen and the microphone and the, the light and whatever, mm -hmm. right? And so these wispy little things arise and cause a few sensations in the room. So this is not spiritual bypassing. This is just reasonable reality testing. And that's what insight practices are about that come and go and morph and change and shift and have a little dance and then they disappear and maybe they get reactivated wispy little thought and then a few little sensations and they do a little dance and then they change and disappear dependent on normal conditions as reality unfolds okay can you keep noticing that from that more complete expanded is the wrong word but inclusive point of view cool book called Shift into Freedom by my friend Locke Kelly that you might check out that kind of talks about that as an interesting way. And what all this is doing, so if, if the problem in the dark night is that we lose perspective and we contract in and we become kind of blind and confused and perspective does this kind of weird space warpy thing. And then the next stage, if we can get to it, the next stage is we can get to it are, are related to equanimity, which is open, expansive, inclusive, integrated, has that that normal perspective rather than that ah well there's a little pain right here i've got to freak out about it perspective right and there's just this the room all the way through is a big open inclusive thing little stuff here that's a very different thing and then that causes a very different set of um feedback loops and a very different relationship to it and a very different set of opportunities and also subtle challenges not to try to solidify space as a solid thing or to totally fetishize that more open, inclusive perspective, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the other trap people can get into. They don't want to ever contract into this again because it hurts. Yeah, it does. But the, the mind contracts and then it expands and it contracts and it expands. So allowing all of those and then the contraction, expansion, and the flowiness, can you synchronize and disappear and reappear as part of the whole thing and be okay? Mm -hmm. Is really kind of the big insight question. Amazing. Yeah, even as you were speaking and kind of giving little reminders of the practice, I can notice, I can notice some pretty serious changes of just noticing. It's very easy for me to get caught in like having this image of a body and like not actually experiencing the sensations of it, but kind of seeing an image of someone sitting right. um, versus as you were speaking, it's like, oh, that's not actually here. It's actually. This well, actually, those sensations of body are also here. So mental sensations occur in this room, mental sensations of a body that you're imagining overlaying on, on the body body, mm -hmm. right? So mental sensations, impressions, the body, physical sensations, the body, both occurring, right, right. visual ideas of the body um, occurring. Or there's noticing the distinction between the actual sensation and then the mental impression. The mental sensations are also sensations. Okay. okay. So there's the physical sensations and the mental sensations. They're different and right. both occur in this three-dimensional space, mm -hmm. both fine. But can you notice that when the mental sensations occur, they're just mental sensations here in the room? Mm -hmm. And when the physical sensations occur, they're just physical sensations here in the room, mm -hmm. changing, changing, natural, most of space. Okay. Right. Little shifting things. Okay. Rising naturally, vanishing naturally, perfectly ordinary, mm -hmm. not graspable, not stoppable, none better than the other, just shifting, shifting, changing, changing. That's the insight perspective on all this. Mm -hmm. And so jhanic practices, going back to concentration, if you mm -hmm. do the jhanic practice as well, you learn the first jhana, which is like with effort and attention, you notice the center of what's going on. There's my object, there's the breath, whatever. Mm -hmm. That can be pasana jhana. The, the breath or the object or whatever starts showing itself to you and the bliss and the peace and the tranquility. And then the third one kind of detunes and gets kind of wide and spacious and tranquil and kind of 
out there is a kind of an interesting way to put it. And then the fourth genre balances that open, expansive out there-ness with the clarity of the things in the center and the natural all the way throughness, and adds kind of the last things, which are things like wonder and curiosity and doubt and confusion and clarity and other subtle mental qualities that don't really fall into the ordinary things. Curiosity, analysis, expectation, mm -hmm. and those hopefully become into the flowing mix, this side and that side in an even way, and then that can synchronize, disappear, and reappear. And so it's but the genic factors and qualities in those states of mind. The fourth one in particular is that open, expansive, inclusive one. And the more time you spend doing that kind of concentration training that's open, expansive, and inclusive, then the more the, the state of mind of equanimity that I was just pointing to that is the antidote to the dark night, or what the dark night can lead to and then open up to, like they're highly related in terms of their basic attentional shape and phase and characteristics. And so learning concentration stuff can help with insight stuff in this kind of way. Wait, say that, say that again. The equanimity that can counteract dark night is similar in its flavor to the, to the fourth genre. Yeah, the fourth. and you'll find this in chapter 30 of my book. So if people go to mctb.org and read chapter 30, it talks all about that. And then the later chapters talk about the pasta genres and stuff in that part four section. Mm-hmm. So, and that's worth looking at. And it builds on what happens in part three. So part three talks about the basic jhanas and then the shamatha jhanas. And then later after the stages of insight are introduced, talks about the vipassana jhanas and how these things are correlated, how they're similar, how they're different, how they can, you know, hopefully all contribute to a very natural recognition of just this space being what mm -hmm. it is doing what it does. Absolutely. Um... As, as I was as I was uh, really reading on the jhanas, I found the jhanas really fascinating because I haven't really done a deep dive on them until your book, and I found it interesting. Do you see Do you see that the jhanas, like it's it's, it seemed to me that I think it was samatha jhanas, not not the shamatha, shamatha, um, yeah. was more like a concentration esque jhana, or or yeah. So that's where you focus on flowing continuous experience the sense of like and so shamatha jhanas are where you're focusing on positive qualities so initially bliss mm -hmm. and peace and mindfulness and equanimity and tranquility you know concentration the seclusion of hindrances mm -hmm. and then you sort of hopefully get better at that and the mind can figure out how to drop the effort and just allow that a more blissful, peaceful version of that state to kind of mm. bubble up and show itself. And then eventually the bliss gets less interesting and the rapture stuff. And then you get this sort of cool, wide bliss that kind of becomes natural. And then eventually that opens up to the wide sort of flowing, even expansive, spacious equanimity that um, can encompass what's going on. And so those are the basic shonic qualities and there's going to be some change in that, some shift, but you don't like, you're not like picking it apart like you would in insight practice. You're not like noticing every little flicker and tingle and sputter and sparkle and, mm -hmm. and shimmer and shift and, and all of that in the same yeah. kind of way. You're more interested in continuity, positive qualities, exclusion of unskillful qualities, right? So that's, so that there's this one side that has one feel. And then the other side is when you, are getting into meditative states, but you're really exactly noticing all the scintillating details, all the shimmer, all the static, all the sparkles, all the tingles, all mm. of the pulses and fluxes, all the interactions, all the oscillations, mental and physical sensations oscillating back and forth very rapidly. That's insight stuff. And mm. it's kind of looking at the jhanas from a very different lens, more of a three characteristics lens. Mm -hmm. to see them in the light of wisdom and to see all of their intricate details rather than kind of semi-mentally glossing them into a flowing, stable, kind of a continuous thing, which they aren't. But you can kind of look at them through that lens, which can be skillful for a while. Um, and so if no, if someone if someone's starting a practice and has very little concentration, building up the concentration genres, it sounds like can be really important. And when I was, when I was going through your book, 
I was like, all right, what is a John? Like, cause like a John can be like a new word. And I was like, all right, I concentration, like building focus, building ability to sit with one focus object for a long period of time and not. Well, that's initially how it starts. And then you start then to see the, a lot more details of it. And then you start to go wide and expansive and then eventually very equanimous and flowy and spacious. Right, right. So it's almost so, like, it almost like, yeah, it sounds like starts it starts with a basic point. object and it starts to become more and more inclusive. Yeah. but also more exclusive in some ways of, of other factors of mind. Gotcha. So yeah, less skillful factors of mind are less interesting or so what, what is it? What is it? What, uh, help me understand this. Um, um, what did you say in the jhanas? It's not like engaging with hindrances. What is right. That? So that the mean? hindrances, right. So the, the, the typical thing is the first jhana would exclude hindrances. The hindrances are things like restlessness and worry, um, desire, doubt, fear, anger, rumination, guilt, misery. You know, there's a standard list of five, but really it's a bunch of things, mm -hmm. right? And these are the things that, that draw us into thinking, tape loops of the mind, speculation, history, and um pull us away from the positive factors of bliss and rapture tranquility equanimity and mindfulness and so when you're starting with the jhanas really really letting yourself letting letting the blissful really positive state envelop you i, I was experimenting with this yeah. this week and it was really fun to to practice yes. because i was noticing like using breath as an object and I've always had this kind of like stern, serious uh, flavor of my meditation. And I was like, oh, I wonder what the positive feeling was here. It was really cool to notice just using the breath. And then there started to be a positive feeling. And when I didn't like keep pushing it down, it kind of just like kind of ballooned and slowly it felt, it felt kind of like the spaciousness of, of the room, but it was just like, yeah, it felt like a relaxed, like a relaxed, nothing was tense. And it was just a relaxed opening of this like really, really blissful state. And I was like, well, I didn't know I could access bliss by just like focusing on the breath and, and also having the intention of letting the positive just kind of expand on its own. And it took like maybe a half an hour or it was like, it was like expanding over the course of like 30 to 45 minutes and like in the first 10 minutes, just a little bit. And like, it was, it was like kind of slow, but like over the course of like a 45 minute sit, it was like, it just like kept on expanding and expanding. Yeah, an expansion and moving it all through the body and through space and through the mind and everything is very skillful. And the, they talk about expanding out the sign is one of the things you'll see in the old text talking about that and pervading the body with the positive factors and pervading the space with the positive factors. So great. Nice. Good. And, and uh, Lee Brazington there was a lot, has there was a nice still... book on this called Right Concentration that I recommend. It's a nice book and it's a good treatment. Also, Bhante Gunaratana writes some nice, nice stuff about this in the path of serenity and insight. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely want to check those out. Um, yeah, and so going, going uh, back a little bit, um, some of the stuff you're talking about on Insight, I was finding fascinating um, in your book and what you were just speaking on. Um, yeah, there's this. Yes, sir, there's two directions I kind of want to go. One is um, you write consciously bringing forth the statement I am or like I or I have or like like using I in a sentence and noticing the sensations of it in the body. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really fascinating. In but space, like, they're just little sensations. They're just like more sensations, right? Like colors or textures or sounds or mm -hmm. images, right? And almost like uh, when I was trying it and I, I would love to hear your thoughts. When I was trying it, like the mental sensations were, it was really interesting to notice the mental sensations. Like I would say like I am and have all these images of bodies and, and mm -hmm. he, like all, like all of these kind of like. That all arise and change. And so they can't actually be a stable eye given how fast they change and how subtle they are. Right. Right. And just noticing them. Yeah. Really it's just fast. a pattern. It's like a cascade. It's like mm -hmm. if you you know, you tap water and the ripples go out. Yeah. Well, which of them are, the, is the, are there ripples that those are like the ripple, like the eye ripple or yeah. something? <laughs> no, they're just ripples. They just, there's a resonance. I, there's a little cascade of patterns. Okay. You, 
<laughs> cascade of patterns and meanings. They, yeah. there's a cascade of patterns and meanings in space. There's more colors and patterns arising and vanishing, natural, flowy, immediate, ungraspable, knowing themselves where and as they are. Causal. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Th all right. There's another, there's another thing. Um, towards the beginning of your book, you talk about um, noticing reality. I think this may be, I feel a little ill-prepared. I haven't, I haven't uh, gone super deep on arising and passing that, that stage, but I'm, I'm curious, you talk a little bit about, which is something I've been experiencing, experimenting with, um, like when you close your eyes that the body isn't there and when you open it, it's there again, or like you talk about body or, isn't there or, 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 um, you'll know bodily sensations when you close your eyes. Um, that's interesting. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Body. Let me use a different example. Um, there's, there's an object, there's a mic. When I close my eyes, the mic is, isn't there. And then when I open them, that's it, right. Experientially. I think, I think that, experientially right right and so when right. I and eyes, so experience I is the mental... frame for insight practices your right. immediate experience very right. literally uh-huh yeah yeah, yeah. object so, permanence that we learned as a child uh-huh yes this this disappears in the face of what sensations are actually there then and which right aren't. right that this yeah this is that's exactly exactly what i was bringing up which which is we have this sense of like it feels natural to have object permanence. And when I close my eyes to feel like all these objects are permanent, but when I really, really get into the experience, experience of it, it's like, no, my experience is actually maybe a mental image of a mic or like color. It's also transient mental image of mic, also, mental image of mic. Yeah. And just like, it's just like, yeah, it's like a bunch of sensations just happening, colors, sights, sounds. Mm -hmm. of all the, the way through. All the way it's through. It's always been that way. And whether I open my eyes or close them, it's just all it's that's always the same. In yes. from that point of view, that sensations arise and vanish naturally on their own, of mm -hmm. various qualities. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the punchline. <laughs> Amazing. But there's a knowing of it all the way through, such that the interpretation of things when they arise is naturally. Let's just kind of say immediate, you know, transience rather than I am a stable and control self that created this, knows this, holds this, mm -hmm. could fix or freeze this, mm -hmm. should freak out if reality is dissolving. <laughs> I thought it was really fascinating to notice as you were um, speaking, you've, you've, you've wrote a bit about how the, uh, the sense of self takes a lot of energy to keep going. Mm -hmm a very it does. intensive thing the mind is constantly trying to figure out which of these transcends transient sensations that it has no control of is the new self so it has <laughs> oh no it's this sensation it's that sensation it's that sensation it's this sensation that's looking at other sensations no it's just sensations mm -hmm. right but that yeah it's a it's a time-consuming process that turns out it didn't have to do and by doing it it actually creates all kinds of problems mm -hmm. but it's so sure it must at all moments, know which sensation is the self. <laughs> which changing new sensation is the self. How does how does um, noticing to satisfaction play into this? Or, or mm, what, is, yeah. what is the role so that? So that process itself is painful. It's like, uh, 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 the mind's going, uh, 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 uh. It's constantly doing this, like, I'm going to grasp the station in the back of the head, the front of the head, the ears, the ears, the, the image of, you know, bah, I, this, is this is me, 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 this is me. And it's trying to stabilize something in a changing flux of static, basically, you know, like pattern static. And it's like, Ugh. and that, ee, that shifting quality of graspingness of identification is itself painful. And if you get better and better and better at noticing that, that's what drives a lot of movement of mind and mind noise. I have to grasp this. I, and it's, it does it quickly. It's very rapid. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and so, and, and noticing, wait a second. Ah, it can just, oh, I didn't have to do that. And it can drop and disappear and just shift to something else and shift to everything just being where it is without this weird, graspy little sort of mind virus of identification 
end, which didn't do anything good anyway, but somehow was sure, so sure it did. Didn't need to. Mm -hmm. but, but stopping that process is not easy. It's a weirdly pernicious habit. So noticing how painful it is can make it go, oh, I didn't have to. I can just, mm -hmm. <sighs> okay. And clear perception helps with that. Clear perception that none of these things were graspable. So how could it even succeed anyway? It couldn't. And it didn't need to because it couldn't win ever because nothing clear, is stable. Clear, help me understand clear perception, like uh, really just ordinary, seen. straightforwardly mm -hmm. noticing all the little intricate sensations oscillating back and forth okay. that appear to make up a sense mm -hmm. of a self. Right. It's just patterns and shifting familiar sensations, familiar sensations, familiar sensations, transient mm -hmm. familiar sensations, patterns that seem to be the same, but are actually new, fresh sensations through the heart, mind, body. Okay. Shimmering, flickering, natural, ephemeral, causal. Just that. That's it. Noticing that so, again and again, very straightforwardly, completely, for uh -huh. everything. Until it goes, oh, wait, up. Ah, okay. <laughs> Just this. So nice. Straightforward. Okay. Or just this. Ah, kind of hurts today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or whatever it is. But essentially, at some point, this practice shifts from I need to attain this stage or this idea or this attainment or this thing I read about in a book to practice is these sensations occurring now as they are mm -hmm. shifting, shimmering, ungraspable, transient, flowing, arising, naturally disappearing, shifting. Yeah. This becomes the standard, the path and the goal, Dogen's practice, enlightenment, Dzogchen, Mahamudra, all of that, the great seal, awakening, whatever you want to call it. And then Just noticing. It, yeah, the this whole thing, sensation. straight up, awesome. all the way through. As clearly as possible. Yeah, or noticing the natural clarity in them already, mm -hmm. which is already there, mm -hmm. right? You didn't have to do anything to hear that and clap and see my hands move. It just happened. You didn't have to do anything to notice your eyebrows raising there or for them to raise or the smile or the eyes looking to the side. or the, It's just it, nothing extra or additional needed to occur for all those things to be known. Eyebrows raising again. Eyes just like, it's just known. It just is where it is. Everything, thoughts, sensations, everything. Just like that. That's a, that's a really interesting point. I think that... It's called pointing out instructions. Pointing out instructions. <laughs> yeah, because so so much my practice, there's so much effort. Yeah, effort arises. Effort. It's this natural, interesting sensations now. Thoughts of future, I will obtain this, arise now. Thoughts of past, oh, I didn't do this, arise now. Thoughts of, oh, I need to, arise now. Shifting patterns in this three-dimensional room or mm -hmm. space or field or tr under a tree or wherever you find yourself in your yep. car patterns all the way through all this books and hands and faces and bodies and feelings and thoughts rippling shifting moving okay yeah. and this moment it's becomes a standard right, right? Or, and not only becomes the practice, becomes the result. It's the joke and the punchline. It's the way and the light. It's mm -hmm. this. Okay. Yeah, it's like I, there's no effort. There's or even if effort arises. Even if effort. Okay, effort arose on its own. 
You didn't choose for effort to arise. It just like arose. Experience happening. It's like a experience is just happening. I'm not like efforting it into existence. Right. It's, kind of, it's like, it's just like uh, sensations are here. I feel my butt on the chair. I hear they sound. occur. Oh, they stuff. change. They're just, I'm not, I'm not anywhere causing them. They're just kind of doing their thing. Right. That's it. That's the thing. That's really like the thing. That's really it. Straight, mm-hmm. straightforwardly. Nothing more complicated than that. Sensations really. Are just doing their thing. Their all happy. the way through. All, all the, way. the way through the space in this three dimensional thing. So the whole experience. Fluxing. Passing, passing. Nothing is staying the same. Transient. Yep. And it's just all happening. Mm hmm. Let it flow, synchronize, disappear, reappear, shift, flux, however it does. Whatever shape attention takes, however it goes. Okay. And to try to to try to try self on top of that is to try to want it to be something else. But even if I am selfing or I want it to be, those are just more patterns arising. Those are not different. So that, that is... I the- want it to. That just arises. I don't want it to. That just arises. Ah, that's cool. That just arises. Oh, I don't like that. That just arises. Those so are also it all the way through. Every single thing is it. And it's that's all right. sensations and it's all arising and passing. That's right. Even the even the selfing is mental sensations too, that you can also notice arising. That just arise causally and naturally as experiences. This is the path of the Buddhists. And other awakened beings and traditions too, really. And it's easy to get lost and caught up and and forget and oh yeah, but I've got a and I this and oh but yeah and okay, and that happens. Getting lost happens. Finding yourself again happens. Remembering happens. Forgetting happens. Okay, those are just things that happen as patterns of sensations mm-hmm. that we can be clear about or not. But even if clarity doesn't arise, confusion arises. Okay, that's just what happened. Clarity arises. That's what happened. Okay. So, so where do maps fit into all this? Thoughts of maps arise. Okay. The maps are useful. That arises. Oh, this is a pattern that looks like the maps. Oh, this is a pattern that doesn't look anything like the maps. Oh, the maps are really going to help me. Oh, the maps are just a useless distraction. Those are all just sensations that arise in this three-dimensional screen. Like magical display as patterns of shifting little shimmering echoes and the mm-hmm. thing yeah, and then gone. And the so maps can be getting... useful if we're getting thrown off our game okay. or they're, 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 there's something we're not expecting. And that's really causing us to, to not remember this. Okay. Yeah. So but... it's, like, it's like, they could help us um, mm-hmm. come back from traps. If we're like, if we're having yeah. a time noticing arising and passing and sensation or help us take advantage of opportunities you know, so those are that's what they can be useful for. But even all those are just patterns arising and changing now, mm-hmm. and that's the most important thing. Holding right. the view, as my um friend Hokai says, and his tradition says, and lots of other traditions too. Mm-hmm. Actually, you don't grasp the view. The view is shifting immediacy. Yeah. And so, so many there could be a deep conversation of. Are maps useful? Are they useless? Well, how do we use them? Both, Both are true. Maps are really useful sometimes, really harmful sometimes, really beneficial, really not. Uh, it, it varies a lot by the person, by the circumstance, by how they relate to them, by how they understand them, by that moment, by whether or not they're obsessing about them and so getting lost in them or really using them as skillful tools that help them avoid common pitfalls and traps and take advantage of opportunities You know, to normalize, to, oh yeah, oh that, to be reminded of, to, oh yeah, okay then useful, but they can easily become sources of competition, comparison, judgment, contraction, analysis that mm-hmm. take us away from remembering, oh yeah, this, this here, this is, this is happening. practice. This is happening. This is, the practice. this is the path and the way, the method and result. And in a sense, what I'm getting is like the desire to study maps is also a sensation that comes up. Yep. and it's okay. The desire okay. to study maps is okay. 
It's just okay. like the desire to say, screw the maps. Yeah, okay and, the desire, and the desire to throw them away is also sure. okay. That's just sensations happening now, patterns. Okay. I don't like, I don't have any questions. It's just kind of like sitting with, sitting with all of this. Those questions arise. Those are just patterns that occur now. If it arises. And shift and vanish. They shift and they vanish and they arise. If answers arise. Okay. And answers curiosity. arise, shift and vanish. There's curiosity, there's statements, there's questions. Mm -hmm. They're all just arising. And I, could say, and I could say. Remember that. that. Eyes open, eyes closed, both sensations arising and vanishing in this three-dimensional flexing, shimmering thing. Disappearing, never a self in it anywhere. So if fear arises of no self, hopefully some humor will arise too. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel a lightness. Like, it's like fear of self. a lack of Santa Claus. You know? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Which of those sensations could ever be stable? Um. Yeah, so there's this constant part of my mind that wants to like try, like really trying, try. wanting to try arises. Okay, wanting. it's more sensations. Can you track that as a pattern of sensations? A shimmering cascade of familiar yeah. patterns that you know is wants to try. Okay, just investigate that when it arises. Mm -hmm. Wanting to not try arises. Ah, oh, I don't want to try. I want to try. No, I don't. Yeah, yeah I do, but. And watch those dances arise. Okay. Those are shimmering patterns. Cascades of interesting scintillating ripples. Familiar, but each fresh. And it's that freshness and intricacy that can hopefully is interesting. And then they disappear. Space it's, arises and disappears. Yeah. Mind, consciousness arise and disappear. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting this sense talking to you of like there's nothing outside of it. Or it's just like uh how could there be? How could there be anything outside of it? Or I, or or yeah, there's something I'm sitting with which is like there's this like deep desire of like deep desire arises. Um, wanting to find like a, a right. wanting to find arises. A little interesting scintillating <laughs> pattern of shifting shimmering intricacy of various flavors and meanings. Okay. Track that, notice it, mm -hmm. be with it, see what it does, be curious. Or curiosity arises and vanishes. Maybe dullness, oh, I'm tired of looking at that. That's an interesting pattern too. Dullness, the tiredness, the fed upness, all the just. Excitement. The existential dread. That's it. The doubt. The pain, the joy. That's it. The 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows wander through as always. The eight worldly winds of gain and loss, play, praise and blame, um, pleasure and pain and fame and ill repute move through. Okay. <laughs> the elements do what they do. The body does what it does. The mind does what it does. The heart does what it does. Okay. Attention does funny things, expands, contracts, space arises and vanishes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it's, it's all okay. Well, or not okay. Ah, this is not okay. That arises too. This is not okay. More patterns of reality doing what it does. And it's full range. All of these are practice enlightenment from a Dogenian point of view, from a Zazen point of view, from a Dog, uh, Dzogchen or Mahamudra point of view, and even from an insight point of view. The content is irrelevant, noticing it shift and shimmer mm -hmm. insight practices, straight up old school Vipassana, mm -hmm. same point of view, really. Yeah. And it's, and it's the, um,
Eyes closed, body rocks. Okay. There's nothing that's not okay. Even not even the not okayness. Or I, it's not okay. Still it. It's still it. Or oh yeah, I guess this is there's nothing that's not it. That's for certain. No matter how good or bad or painful or pleasurable or hot or cold. From an insight point of view, true. Insight point of now, view. Now from another point of view, from the other first two trainings, morality and ethics, concentration, there is a different relationship to okay and not okay. From a pure insight point of view, whatever arises is equally transient, equally painful if you try to grasp it and make a self out of it, equally causal, equally present when it occurs, equally gone when it's gone. Is there a trap here of um, getting so deep into insight that it almost leads to like a morality or just like? Yes. That's why I made shorter. Talk about three trainings. So you've got to balance each of them. It's easy to get out of balance. Focus too much on psychology and good behavior and making merit. Focus too much on blissful, tranquil states. Focus too much on just everything is fine, changing, 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 however it is. Each of these has its shadow sides and must mm -hmm. be kept in balance. Right. Yeah, I've, I've um, listened to some people deep in the psychedelic space who seem to be I, yeah, it's cool to to put a. What am I trying to say? The, yeah, sometimes the, uh, everything is it can turn into anything you do is okay. Yeah, that's not the same thing. It's not the so same. So insight training, yeah. Read the chapter on the the um the three trainings revisited. Okay. It it talks about that, and how it's really important to not get lost in any of these. Right. They're useful, but they they work best as a set, mm -hmm. like a set of counterbalancing principles. Totally. So would you recommend kind of sensing into for everyone what the balance is between those? All right, concentration. No, that's really right. hard to do to recommend for everyone. Right. That's the tricky thing. So at any one moment, you got to kind of figure out if if someone feels like there's an imbalance or something's going wrong or they're reaching out to a teacher or a book or a community or whatever, a video, a, a writing, a something. What are they looking for? Because they've recognized something's, uh, you know, uh, I don't have, I do have uh, too much of, not enough of something. And then you've got to figure out, okay, what is that? Is there something under that that's really going on? You know, talk to them a bunch about their practice, how they're conceptualizing, what their goals are, what their risk tolerances are, what their strengths are what's going on right now, other emotional and psychological stuff. Like it's a, it's a, this is a complicated thing. So I'm, I'm not saying I recommend for everybody. I don't know how to do that, you know, beyond the, the most superficial of generalities. Um, Cause everybody's in a different place and dealing with a different set of things. It's like Achan Cha said in a still forest pool, you know, he's like, you know, people have criticized me. They said, you know, some people you say, go to the right. And other people you say, go to the left or whatever. But it's like, no, because I get a sense of where they, you know, how they need to rebalance. Mm -hmm. This is very, very specific to the individual. Yeah, sure. And their situation. Like mm -hmm. I might give totally different sets of possible advice or suggestions or, you know, ideas really. Um, for, you know, someone who like had a bunch of kids and a bunch of jobs and was trying to stay stable and just get through life versus some trust fund kid who's wanting to go out and blow their consciousness out and really plunge the depths. And that's just what they're going to do, you know, so maybe at least they do it with some good frameworks and some support, you know, some normalization of what that can look like. These, these are really different situations, you know, or someone who's going to, you know, I was just talking to someone who was like, do I go do a bunch of academia? But what I really want to do is ordain and spend a few years in monasteries. Like, and will it be okay coming back to academia after that? Well, this is a really complicated question. This has made, well, you know, may, they've got to sort that out for themselves, but it would have major implications for their life going forward. And both could be cool or, you know, but you just, you know, I don't yeah. know how to tell them what's best, but I could, you know, listen to them and, provide some ideas as they talk about it, you know, be a sounding board or a resonance or a mirror, maybe. Mm -hmm. 
what's the role of a teacher here? Are there are there are there is there a way to go at it alone or will there always be blind spots if we or is there a high chance of like having traps and blind spots if we try to go at it alone? There are traps and blind spots in both, right? I mean, things with teachers can go well or disastrously, same with solo practice. And and most people oscillate back and forth, right? So there's natural oscillation. It's hard to do a one size fits all again. Mm-hmm. Both have their troubles. People who you know over rely on teachers and become dependent, sort of put the teacher on a pedestal and themselves subtly down, and or like become you know usually they end up playing out all their attachment issues, you know whether they're anxious or avoidant or securely attached. All that gets to play out in some way with their teacher. There's a ton of transference and countertransference and people getting wrapped up in the complicated roles and dynamics and all of that. And that can be fun and rich and amazing, just like therapy or whatever. But it can also be disempowering and like you know cause a lot of stagnation or a lot of chaos or scandals or whatever mm-hmm. and then there's the other side of trying to just oh i'm just going to figure this out in my own it's me and reality and there are stages when that's really the good thing to do i mean at some point all of us have to just set down here's my heart mind body thing what does it do how does it work i got to figure this out and you got to learn you know it's like you can have a driving teacher but at some point you just got to learn to drive Someone can tell you how to ride a bicycle, but you got to get there and feel how the thing moves when you push a pedal and you turn the thing and you like, that's, that's, you see what I mean? And so, you know, like a golf game, I'm not a golfer, but like, you know, someone was telling me all about how they were obsessed with golf and their golf swing and how they got all these advice and these pieces of like hand position and feet and weight and balance and shoulders and all this stuff. I, I, again, I don't know squat about golf really, but he was telling me about this and he was like, but I realized at some point I had to like, like let go of all that and just put it in together into a swing, you know? And so I can really, <laughs> It's like trying to teach somebody how to surf or skateboard, you know, or play tennis. There's a, there's a visceral interactive component that you just have to, your muscle memory and your attention memory and your pathways in your brain have to feel into this, you know? Yeah. 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 I I, I was a big golfer and I can resonate like uh, spending years and years trying to, to master the technique in, in my score. One, like there was one, time where I would like practice like three hours a day for over the like wow. over the course of a while and I never I didn't really get that much better because it, it's such a spiritual game because if you have too many thoughts about what to do with your body during the swing it just messes it up no matter what so no matter how flawless the 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 swing is if you're if you're having too many swing thoughts it's like totally like a you have to get in this like concentration state to like, just like, oh yeah, it's just going to let, let the swing do its thing. You know, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. So that anyway, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Balance, maybe a balance of, of teacher, no teacher alone. Sure. And even if you have a teacher, like let's say you go on retreat and I have a teacher you might get to talk with them for like 10 minutes every two days or something on a standard retreat. You know, the vast majority of it's you and your, this Uh thing doing the dance and figuring it out. Right. So even with teachers and frameworks and, you know, techniques and all that vast majority of it's still you. And so, and some kind of intuition about it has to arise that that goes beyond techniques. Not that techniques can't be super useful. They can be in frameworks and maps. You know, that's, there's physiology to this, there's standard traps, there's all that, but. That's what I was, yeah, that's what I was really asking about. Like, what what is that? You know, it's like this, this sensing, this intuitive kind of, there's no answers, but there's still kind of like this intuitive pull towards maybe at one point in our life, we need to, we need this or, or are there, could the intuition be wrong or, you know, there's mm-hmm. just, and what are you doing this for, by the way? What are your goals in this? Meditation. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I when I sit with what my goals are, it's like, I how could I not do this? It's almost like a. It just sure. feels like, it just feels like where my, what I need to do with my life. You know, like when I think about 
taking other life paths and going down these rabbit holes. It's like, but I'm not meditating. So what am I doing is kind of like the thought. And so like, I'm not sure why I'm not really sure why I'm doing it. It just feels right. Or just like, if, if I'm not doing it, something feels off. If I'm not investigating the experience, it feels like I'm living the same, like the, like the sensation of suffer, suffering, uh, stays the same day after day after day no matter how much work I put into my life and so it's like uh yeah I should probably investigate investigate this it just feels like what needs to happen almost okay I don't know it's cool. like I, I have been enamored by the awakening stuff in the past and in the, in the past uh all <laughs> the enamored by awakening stuff Enamored, enamored by with awakening stuff. Enamored Wait, by, oh, oh yes. Oh no. Oh yeah. Mm, I don't know. Maybe, but mm. yeah, it, it patterns changes. the sensations that arise now. Yeah. yeah. That's actually really important to practice awakening, not awakening. Awakening. Like like patterns. noticing the mental like I, not I. Awakening. I will get awakened. I will not get awakened. <laughs> These are just patterns that occur now. Not that, you know, go for awakening, whatever, but recognize it's got to involve this moment. Yeah. Literally. Like, yeah. literally. Because there is no other option, really. Thought of another option. It's just what's happening. That was out of no was, other options. That was one of the reflections I got after. Um, some of the psychedelic experiences specifically bufo got this reflection of like that is not out there like don't don't like make it this object of like way out there that thing that happened that was crazy and intense thing that happened was crazy intense yeah it's like right here it's like yeah Mm -hmm. it's right here it's no it's no other place awesome um yeah, it was really great. It was really great speaking with you, Daniel. I really, really appreciate your insight. And uh, I really, I felt I felt a bit of a, a challenge, a really good challenge there, you know, like uh, bringing me back, bringing me back, noticing when I start going off and just being like, oh yeah, that's a mental sensation. That was but nice. Like track it as a pattern, as a, as a little cascade. Like it's not just a mental sensation, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. It's a, of it's a, it's a like it's it's a each of these things are like a a network a, a a progression a shimmer. Do you play an instrument? Um, or what do you you play uh, guitar? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So like it's like they're like chords and you strum them and the chord has an envelope and a bunch of different strings or something. It's a it's a it's a it's not just a that's a sensation. It's it's a it's shimmering integrated in, you know oscillating patterns. Mm-hmm. And those are interesting, you know. So not just seeing it as one, but seeing it as unfolding of many rapid, right, a little arising, mm, passing of trend. meanings of images, of physical sensations, of sounds, of sights, of bodily and stuff. They're uh-huh. a cascade, uh-huh. and and these cascades, you can get more and more used to each of these cascades, and more and more like, oh, there's this cascade, you know. Mm, you start to catch it, like mm-hmm. as it's starting and noticing the unfolding of the and familiarity mm-hmm. of it. Like, ooh, would you see that? that at, would you like say like emotional experiences, like a uh, everything? Emotional is exposed to the most interesting from point from a cascade point of view. So I'm saying, like something. Oh, there was the thought. Something. There was the physical sensation. There was the blooming yeah. of it. There was the reactions to it. There's uh-huh. the complicated dance around it. There's yeah. the yeah. oh, I like that. I don't like that. Oh, oh. Uh-huh. that whole. Mm-hmm. That whole thing, right? It's a, it's a 3D, intricate, intimate, multifaceted, you know. In every single moment. Every single yeah. Moment. And you can get more familiar with the patterns and go, oh, that's that pattern. That's this. Okay. And then they learn to recognize themselves like they always kind of did, but somehow didn't notice that. Absolutely. Not effort. Not, I guess, yeah, effort is also a effort, right. not effort. Here's yeah. effort. I'm gonna effort. I'm not gonna effort. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> Those are all just things that arise. Like, uh huh. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's all happening without mm -hmm. us doing it. Without a, I doing it. That's right. I'm doing it. Just another pattern that arose. It's another pattern. Disappeared. I'm not doing that. Yes, I am. Seeing all the things the eye does as also patterns of sensations, mental mm -hmm. illness. Help me, help me um, really quick. Uh, the first stage um, that you lay out, um, I think you call it like distinguishing between mental and physical. Yeah. What is the value of distinguishing between them rather than just seeing them all as sensations? So to see them all as sensations, you have to have mind and body. So without mind and body, there's a sense of contraction into your thoughts. I am my thoughts. My thoughts are me. Like there's not an ability to see thoughts as objects. Yeah. This is a perceptual shift that it's like all of a sudden, oh, I can see this thought and this image as objects that occur where they do rather than this sense of like totally tightly into them. So you can't actually investigate them as sensations. Okay. And so distinguishing them helps you actually see the mental as objects. See, feel, hear the mental hear, yeah. as objects Screen. and as meanings that occur in space. And not just who you are. Right, or not. Stake yourself to be, yeah, who you're right. in, into. Okay. That's really helpful. Yeah, and that's like, that's the first critical insight. That's the one that mindfulness makes tremendous use of. Like mindfulness, like the big psychological tradition. Mm -hmm. because if you can get people to not be so contract, I'm so angry at this person, you know, what? oh, wait, those sensations of anger and thoughts of and images of the person. These are really different perceptual things, and that's a major upgrade that then is vastly more workable. Mm -hmm. right? That's mindfulness's whole shtick, you know, and it's a good shtick. It's just a start. Just a start, yeah. A foundational piece, a first good step. And then as you notice them as objects, then you really investigate. Then you can notice, oh, wait, I had an intention to think a thought, and I thought a thought. I thought a thought, and then there was a physical sensation that arose from it. I heard Daniel clap, and then I can replay the mental impression of what the clap sounded like, but it's not really the same as the clap. Mm -hmm. So you get cause and effect, and then you start to notice that's cause and effect. And then you start to notice the next stage, three characteristics, wait a second. That cause that clap was gone. This mental sensation arises. That this arises. They happen on their own. And there's this weird kind of tension and trying to track that and figure it out. And uh, and like, wait a second. And it starts to speed up. And it starts to get more intricate. And it starts to like get into the dance of this intricate thing of mental sensations, physical sensations, intentions, actions, sensations, mental impressions. You know, thoughts, feelings, emotions, reactions. It all starts to get awesome, into the awesome. the richness of human experience, right? And then if you get fast enough at that, you start to get into the arising and passing away, right? And then on from there. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, like the cause and effect is like uh, seeing the cascade and seeing how one thing can trigger mm -hmm. the cascade. And then the next one is mm -hmm. noticing how it's not one thing triggering the cascade. It's just a constant transient changing thing and it's mm -hmm. not and with more intricacy and naturalness with more intricacy more, more higher resolution higher resolution yeah more yeah, more detail second, more information you start to see all of its tricks of how it seemed to cre create a sense of a self how it seemed to turn this this transient natural intention stream into a doer and it mm -hmm. seemed to create this sense of mental impressions as a knower it seemed to create the sense of a body as a continuous thing. And it seemed to create the sense of being as a stable thing that always is. And I was always the same. It's never like a fresh, new, transient set of oscillations or scintillating resonances or whatever. Mm -hmm. And how does that um, morph into a rising and passing? And then when it gets fast and detailed and bright, and zzz, then it can start to really cut through the sense of stability and then that you know and then eventually you start to get to seeing things dissolve and then all the strange reactions that happen from that as you get into the, the knowledges of suffering and the dark night and then eventually you come to some balance and open spaciousness like we were talking about in the beginning the room is just this flowing open thing with little sensations that may be disconcerting in it as part of just being here and okay space and then 
realizations as it synchronizes and vanishes and disappears and reappears. Totally. What is vanishing and reappearing? The Reality. whole thing. So Reality goes. Thing. Okay. Totally yeah. synchronized with it at full frame rate. So when it's when it's disappearing, it's just like a space is disappearing, body disappearing, everything disappearing. Okay, great. The actions disappearing mm -hmm. because it's so high resolution. It's so mm -hmm. at the speed. It's it's getting near the speed at which reality is actually doing its thing. That's right. Which it always was. Ever anyway. which it always was. We just had things blocking somehow. There's illusion it, blockages are illusions, but they still are functionally real. Blockages are still it, but functionally they can derail practice. Blockers are also sensations. Right. That's the shift. Blockers are also sensations. What mm -hmm. what what actually is the shift of like lower resolution to higher resolution? That that's a critical part of it, and more inclusion to less inclusion. I mean, from less inclusion to more inclusion. So when we're, when we're aware of less sensations and less clear, what is, what is that? Is it just like fogginess or is it just like... But fogginess can be it too. So that's the other problem. This is where this gets complicated, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, fogginess yeah. is it too. And fogginess is very intricate and complicated and lots of little arising, ch chancing things. And here we get into the, so the great paradoxes. And the great paradoxes are that clarity and unclarity are both it but it's easier to wake up in the face of clarity <laughs> <laughs> what's going on so that's where you get this weird tension between the concentration practices that are about specific qualities like clarity and concentration and insight practices that are about whatever qualities arise just changing 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 mm -hmm. regardless of what they are and that's the great tension between these two that we started out with mm -hmm. Um, okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, hmm. Yes, thank you for uh, yeah, thank you for this. Sure. And um yeah, so books we recommended just to resummarize, right concentration by Lee Brasington, mm -hmm. um shift into freedom by Lot Kelly. Uh, Path of Serenity and Insight by Bhante Gunaratana. And I also really like his mindfulness in plain English. It's really simple, but quite profound. Um, and of course, the ever popular A Path with Heart by Jack Kornfield. Um, we don't always get along as people, but I still really like his book and recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, that's a a lot of books to check out get get to reading get to practice or just this or just this shimmering shifting cascading all right perhaps perhaps as as you're reading yeah sure absolutely can be done awesome would you like to share any links um where users can find more of your work where they can check out sure you can go to mctb.org, which is my book for free online. And the other book I did with Shannon Stein, um, it's her practice journal about her retreat. Uh, you can find it Fire Casino with a K, F I R E K A S I N A dot O R G, and a lot of interesting reports um, from people exploring that fascinating practice. You can find my main website at integrateddaniel.info. Uh, and the primary thing I spend most of my time on these days is the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, the EPRC uh, dot org, T H E E P R C dot org, and then Emergence Benefactors, which I'm the CEO and board chair of, is the charity to support that. Um, that's at ebenefactors ebenefactors dot org, and those are dedicated to upgrading the clinical uh, mainstream's relationship to the deep end of human experience. Um, from a very phenomenological and outcome space point of view. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. And cool. And the Dharma Overground, if you're looking for a fascinating community, dharmaoverground.org. It's another yeah. fun one. Dharma Overground. Amazing. That's a forum, right? It's a forum. Old school forum. But a lot of very interesting discussions there and sometimes very helpful. And a fascinating community. It's an online of... forum. It has its quirks and things like any <laughs> online forum. But yeah. There's a lot of good things about it. 
amazing thank you for sharing your wisdom and sharing your work and uh yeah thanks be to everybody who figured the stuff out i was not smart enough to figure it out but i was smart enough to follow instructions um mm -hmm. when i realized they were useful and so yeah thanks to everyone who passed this stuff on over thousands of years and wrote all these cool books and and helped us figure out the stuff today for ourselves so anyway go practice this one dude's opinion on the internet hopefully if this is useful for you if not let it go find something else that is and uh good luck <laughs>